Okay. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Irish Wildlife Trust webinar for this month. Um, my name is Kieran Flood, and I'm the general manager here at the Irish Wildlife Trust. So, um, thank you for joining us tonight. Just a quick word about who you're with. So, the Irish Wildlife Trust is a charity which aims to protect and restore Ireland's wildlife and habitats. And we do this through um, motivating and supporting people uh, to take action to protect nature. And we do that in various ways. Um, one such way is to share information such as through these webinars about solutions that are out there and projects that are already helping um, conserve nature. So um, that's the Irish Wildlife Trust. We are a membership-based charity. And if you like our work, you can subscribe on our website and you'll get our magazine quarterly uh, and you will be supporting our work. So you can go over to idg.ie after this if you want to join our charity. Okay, so um, thank you for coming along to this webinar. Um, we will be running until eight o'clock and we're We'll, we have a Q&A function, so if you want to interact, uh, ask some questions on the topic, do feel free to stick them in the Q&A. You'll see it down the bottom of your screen. The chat function is live, but we won't be monitoring that for questions. Feel free to, to chat there. Um, but if you want to put a question uh, up for discussion, stick it in the Q&A. So I'll be keeping an eye on that, and uh, we'll take a few questions at the um, after the presentation. So the other thing to say is this webinar is being recorded, which means if you know anyone who might want to watch it later, or if you like it so much you want to watch it twice, uh, you'll be able to catch it on our YouTube channel um, in the next few days. We'll put it up there with a, with a link in our, or our website to the YouTube channel. So that is the plan. And so now um, for this evening, we are going to be looking at a project called um, Life on Macair. And there's no better way to find out about that project than by chatting with our guest tonight, which is Dr. Catherine Farrell, who is the project manager of Life on Macair. So hello and welcome, Catherine. Hello. Hello, everybody. And delighted to join you by Zoom. I haven't done this in a while, so I'm sort of hoping it'll go OK. So great to be uh, yeah. here. I'm sure it will. Um, it's not as much fun as the real thing, but it's uh, no, <laughs> but it's good. Um, okay, so Grant, well, Catherine, um, I'll hand the floor over to you. But essentially, Catherine's got a presentation, so uh, some images and some information. But we will be stopping for questions after uh, about half an hour. So that's it, really. I'll hand over to Catherine to share a screen and tell us all about this project, and then we'll have a chat uh, at the end. So, um, first of all. Thanks, Catherine, for giving us your time tonight. And um, yeah, work away. OK, well, thank you, Kieran. And as I say, it's great to be here. And I'm delighted to have this opportunity to talk about uh, life on Maher. Uh, most people might know me for working on peatlands. And um, but I suppose my driving force has always been to restore uh, habitats as much as possible and very much um linking the habitats with the species so this project life on macher is a, a six year project and the way i've sort of built the presentation this evening i was going to give an an introduction into what is macher what are macher systems you know why they're important for us and then some of the driving forces which led to the development of this project and then I'll get into some of the actions in relation to working with farmers, community engagement, and then we can talk a little bit about how everyone can make a difference for Macair. So the project is essentially an EU life project, which some people will be familiar with. It's basically an EU fund or support for Natura 2000 sites. So Many of our Natura 2000 sites, which are SACs and SPAs, are not in a good uh, condition. And this fund allows for focused activities on those SACs to help improve and 
address issues that are leading to degradation of some of the qualifying interests, um, which can be habitats or species. So that's where we get the money. So it comes from the EU. And then the project is a collaboration between the National Parks and Wildlife Service. Service. So they are the key beneficiary um, within the project. And they brought together really the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine, and Chagas and Falch Ireland. So it's very much a learning process. And I certainly feel that the partners working together is bringing thoughts and minds and, and hearts, as Brendan Dunford always says, together in a way that, you know, we're challenging each other in terms of the process that are there to help protect these mature 2000 sites and the species and habitats within. So I will get stuck into um, the next part, which is thinking MACAIR. So MACAIR is a word that maybe some of you haven't really come across or, or you might think of Maher and really the next couple of slides we're going to go into that in a bit more detail and this is a wonderful picture these sort of intermittent slides and pictures are coming from Peter uh, of Crowcrag Productions who's been developing some videos for us so they are not mine at all but they're absolutely splendid pictures to encourage a love of all things Macare. So what is a MACAIR system? So the MACAIR system really comp comprises a mosaic of habitats. It runs from the beach right up to the wetlands, which usually back onto the peatland behind the MACAIR. Um, so these systems essentially are found only from, we'll say the Iron Islands, all up around the northwest coast of Ireland, up along the northwest coast of Scotland. So that's their their remit, that's the envelope within which we find them. So essentially what happens is we have an accumulation of sand up on the beach. So those, those sand deposition events, some are quite dramatic. And then in some areas it's sand accreting gradually over time. Uh, those large deposits of sand then been blown back out across the landscape. And essentially here we have the prevailing wind blowing the sand across a plain. So that's where the Maher, Maher plain um, comes into being. Where the sand sticks. So all that wind driving the sand across this landscape uh, along the northwest coast of Ireland in these pockets, where that sticks, you get this really uh, interesting grassland habitat, which is importantly developed and has developed over time in conjunction with cattle grazing. So these are very much cultural ecosystems. We have the sand, we have the wind, we have those climatic processes uh, mixed with the, the biophysical features, but having the cattle grazing these areas maintains species diversity and essentially that open structure. So keep that in mind. So farming is really important. And these areas have developed hand in hand with farming over millennia. So uh, really interesting um, habitats. And I suppose in Ireland, we 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 don't really use the word macare. Um, along the Mullet Peninsula and Connemara, they talk about the, the sandy banks or the beach. Whereas when we get into Donegal, there is more reference to place names like the Dua or the Dúch. So it really refers to a commonage or an open fertile plain. And essentially it was where people would bring their cattle to in the winter and then they put them back up onto the hill in the summer. So I know many of you are aware of the great work done um, in terms of understanding the bullying system and you know how the uplands um, were used as an integral part in farming in Ireland. Um, so here we have the Macair um, systems. Interestingly as well, uh, these areas overlap very much with the, the Irish language um, clusters in Ireland. And, you know, so there's, there still is a strong connection between language, the, the Gaelga Agus, uh, na, na Laoganamaka, and Sna Ochna So, 
really important. So why is life on Mac Air special? So you have these unique systems. Surely that's good enough. You know, you just have these wonderful ecosystems that are only found, but they're really places where we find a number of species that have been really pushed to the edge of their range within Ireland. So I'm from the Midlands. And when I was growing up in the late 70s and early 80s, there was a drive towards intensification of agriculture, drainage of wetlands. And I do remember lapwing, you know, on our farm and they disappeared across, you know, uh, many places in the Midlands. And so a lot of these, um, Mac air systems have become refuges for um, iconic species like lapwing. And I have a photograph here of a dunlin, which tragically um, less than 50 breeding pairs of this species remain in Ireland. So they're really hanging on on these Mac air coastal sites and other species such as the great yellow bumblebee, which we also call the blonde bombshell of the mullet. And this species was once more widespread in Ireland. Um, it's now just confined to these Mac Air systems in Ireland and in Scotland. So they're really important from this perspective to get the balance right for the species that live there. And not just that, the habitats, there's two priority habitats listed here, six dune grassland and Mac Air. So, there's a big onus on us to get it right for them. And um, I suppose the other aspect that we have to consider is climate change and that many of these areas may, may be, be underwater in, in, a, in the next century or, or so. So it's how do we work with them to make them resilient to change and to conserve as much as we can for the future. Um, so yeah there's there's lots of lots of reasons why it's special and if we look beyond the habitats and the species we also look that these areas are really important for grazing so if we look at the broader gambit of ecosystem services uh, that these sites provide they also provide coastal protection so for many houses will be protected by mac air systems uh, often the wetlands are really important in terms of regulating flooding so many sites have coastal lagoons integrated into the system and they're actually really important for other things such as carbon stores. So um, lots of good things um, are given by these systems to us. And I suppose it's part of life at Mac Air to highlight all these benefits that we get, but also that if we lose, what happens when we lose these, these great services? So I suppose by now you'll have gotten the sense that we're working at a system level and working with a local artist here in the West of Ireland, Lorna Goggins, we've developed some infographics to help convey the messages and why it's important to work at the system level. So working from the beach all the way up to the peatlands, which usually are sort of are on the landward side of the Mac Air system. Interestingly, we're also looking at what's happening in the water. So within the water, we have our kelp beds and our eelgrass, and they help to slow down the movement of water and the wave action and therefore have an impact on the system as well. So that's a really interesting piece, making that connection between land and sea. So the infographic shows we have lots of different habitats. We have different species using different parts of the system. We have cattle here, we have sheep on the hill. Now, this is the ideal scenario and um, doesn't really reflect, reflect what's happening on the ground in terms of many of the sites are indeed heavily grazed by sheep. Um, so these infographics are available from the website that we have and you can download them for your own use or if you're if you're working with school children or just just to download them. So in terms of a health check, so we've described the system, it's really important. Um, I've taken two aerial images. So this one here on the right is from Runa. So some of you might actually know Karaniski Beach, you might have surfed on the beach, 
or you might have just gone for a, a really amazing walk because it's always windy on this site I've very rarely arrived to a calm uh, scenario so don't leave your car door open for too long you know, if you park up um, so here are the red dots relate to where the waders are using the site and if we just look at some of the activities around the site we see our lapwing are trying to nest in and this cluster around the lake um, another site nearby, we see uh, a similar layout where the, the lapwing and the waders are using uh, the wetland areas. But our activities here include, um, so we drive on the Mac Air site. And so we drive across them. Amazingly, a priority habitat, you really wouldn't get people driving across active raised bog. But because this is solid underground, and there's no signage in general on these sites. We 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 have, and I put myself in there, we have driven across these unknowingly or unwittingly. We do have a number of predators in the landscape as well, which there's an imbalance there. We have our overgrazing and we have our storms. But I suppose what where we come into it, uh, you know, for those of us who don't own macro sites, what we do on the sites can matter in terms of camping the the rubbish you know any sort of fires while camping just sounds amazingly romantic but you know think before you go and do it and um uh, think about your impact on the site and, and where's the right place to be camping so within life on mac Air, we're addressing the issues relating to the farming importantly from the tourism and amenity and one of the things that we don't often think about is what is the effect of the predation on the birds within the area as well. So we're looking at habitat, the pressures, in, including what we do, but also the imbalance in terms of predators. And of course, we keep an eye on big storm events, which are becoming um, much more of an influence on these sites. When they're not robust and resilient, they're less able to withstand big storms. So back in 2011 and 2014, there was quite a devastating impact on some of these Mac Air sites because they were already degraded for one reason or another. So this health check basically says we need action, which, um, you know, is reflected through these photographs. So this is a, a picture of another site down in Connemara where you see there has been ongoing quarrying of the sand. So you can see there's considerable depth of sand accumulated on these sites over time. Aoife Delaney is quite tall. She puts me in my little pocket over there of a short average person. So, you know, there's a lot of sand eroding and being lost from these sites. Other things in relation to overgrazing, but ring feeders, um, temporary structures, are they temporary really? Sometimes they become very permanent and these can have a really negative impact on the habitat quality here. So over the course of the last year and a half, we've mapped out the various pressures in terms of agriculture, tourism, and importantly, we're in the process of not just calling out the pressures, we have to come up with solutions um, in order to address these things. So, you know, through the farming, it's education awareness. You know, we've talked about uh, results-based schemes through the Wild Atlantic Nature Project, Concrete Life. So I'm sure you're quite familiar with those issues. And then a lot of the time it's education, just why the sites are important, why they're vulnerable and how we can work better with them. More specifically for the waders, we are looking at using uh, temporary predator control fencing, um, better signage, directional signage. And um, so that's really important. We can't do that without working with the farmers. So many of these are commonages. So in some instances, you might have up to 50 commonage shares and shareholders that you need to talk to so you can put up your temporary fence. So really important to work with people and explain why you're doing it. So with all of that, I think we, we know now why there's a Life on Mac Air project and really what was the driving force behind it. So it was developed by 
um, two people in the scientific unit, Sean Kelly and Aoife Delaney, who deal specifically with uh, wetland birds and coastal systems, um, respectively. So they brought together the, the different beneficiaries. And even though there are many more Mac Air sites, you can see the pink areas here are those that have been selected for inclusion within the project. All Mac Air sites are important and special. These specific ones relate to where there's that strong overlap between the waders, waders using these sites and uh, the need for concentrated focus and uh, restoration or actions to help the sites. So we have two in Connemara, we have five in Mayo, and then every now and then I have to drive all this way up to Donegal to check in with the team there. So, you know, they're quite spread out, which can be challenging, um, but the sites are amazing. And um, equally, we've had great experience with the different community groups and stakeholders. Um, so, yeah, that's why we need this project. And that's why, importantly, we need all these partners on the project. So, you know, for a number of years where we've all been working in different silos and sort of saying, well, we should be doing that, we should be doing that. And it's time for that to kind of start to come together a bit better, for sure. Um. For the nerds here who want the specific component objectives, I've listed them out on the slide here, but just to say that it relates to agricultural management agreements with the farmers, site-specific conservation interventions. So some of these are new and they're innovative. These temporary predator control fences are quite new and we had great fun last year uh, uh, putting them up around the place. Um, the team was very kind of, you know, while you're coming from an ecological background, sometimes hammering posts into the ground can be a really enlightening awakening in terms of logistics. Um, so then working with the farmers and communities. So while it, originally this was earmarked to be a results-based project or developing a results-based approach, because the Acres Cooperation Project teams had um, kicked in, uh, we spent some time just stepping back and seeing well, what value can we bring? And we've developed our program to be a participatory program, which is ideal really, because it all relates to spending time together with the farmers. So we can learn how they view the sites and how we can work together. So it's essentially a participatory program that we've developed. Uh, tourism, really important. So at the moment we're, in the process of uh, scheduling a series of tourism workshops in the in the local project areas, and they will be um, notified through the website and also the social media. And you know, with all life projects, so a project is just a flash in pan. It's just there for a moment. Everything we do has to feed into the longer term management and to integrate the learnings into the MPWS um, regional management to the Department of Agriculture, Falch Ireland, and how Chagas relates to their farmers through their training programs. So uh, if we if we do nothing on the ground, it's about trying to ensure that the education and awareness is developed within the, the beneficiaries. Um, uh, knowledge and capacity building there. Our expected impacts, I don't like this slide because I know we're, we're not going to make everything rosy, um, but it is important to set targets. And I have a great concern specifically for Dunlin with less than 50 pairs breeding in Ireland. Um, our ambition is to try and maintain at least uh, the air prayers on our sites uh, with the dry summer this year that didn't go too well because there was such a drought at some sites there was a lack of feeding and disturbance is a huge thing for Dunlin. Um, so we have our expected outcomes and obviously we're not doing any of this in a bubble it all has to work in line with 
our partners and our friends in Corn Creek. You know, there was a previous life project up at Termancara where uh, we're working closely there with Birdwatch Ireland. We're working with the Great Yellow Bumblebee, EIP, the Acres team, the Clean Coast Group, um, the CARO program. So it's it's been a huge learning process for me um, coming to terms with, you know, all the, the different interests in this area, but there's so much good work. So I feel the challenge now is to bring it together so we don't double the effort and we make sure that we're bringing value specifically to where we need to uh, to get um, action. So we will we'll really be focusing on restoration planning and, you know, what does that mean? So, I mean, I've been working on restoration for nearly 25 years and it's as basic as listing out what you can do in a site and working across. And importantly, restoration plans should never be you know just written because no one reads them then they're a moment in time they have to be live you have to be flexible you have to adapt and change and you have to learn as you go because as, as I mentioned already some of this work is quite innovative and new so we're working on our restoration plans lots of ideas around chestnut fencing marron planting seeding with native species Seaweed application was used traditionally in these Mac Air sites, and that could be a really good way of um, making use of a local natural resource to help stabilize certain areas. Um, the grazing regime is critical for these sites. Um, and getting that right is actually the biggest challenge uh, for us. Um, and then all sites need education and awareness and some protection for the birds. So we're working on those restoration plans. They have to be informed by the baseline ecological understanding, but critically, it has to be with the farmer understanding as well. So they know these sites better. So all of our actions have to go hand in hand with the engagement with the farming community. Um, as an example, I've sort of brought up this um, area Murphy Macher, which is in Connemara. It's just west of Dogs Bay. And when we visited this site last year, we found extensive areas of erosion. Um, so back to the storms, there had been overgrazing at the site, which caused degradation. And that led to, you know, a complete loss of the vegetation across up to 50% of the site. How do you restore this? So this is really interesting for me coming from a wetland ecology side of things. You have all this sand, which is, you know, you can just see the guys here and, you know, some of the, I, I used to think in peat hags and now I'm thinking in sand hags that, you know, they're scattered throughout the site. It's a source of sand for the area. It, sand is not so much of a pollutant or contaminant as peat would be. So, there's not so much of an urgency to stabilize these. And so it's more about getting the sand to move within the system. So it's it's really quite interesting from that perspective. And we're building up a, a series of actions where we can, you know, have, have focused understanding as we go, understanding of the outcome of all the different uh, restoration actions. So that's just an example of, you could spend a whole life project on this site. It has brings great opportunities for learning uh, and equally great opportunities for change and improvement. So here we have great support from NUIG, from the team there. And importantly, the farmers have agreed to take all the stock off until we get this site right. And their support, obviously, through the Department of Agriculture to do that. And we've had an extensive program of chestnut fencing along the beaches here this year. So watch this space. So as I as I keep saying, farmer engagement is critical. And what does that look like for us? So when when we started, it became quickly clear to me that all sites were different with some commonalities. So common threads, um, often misguided agricultural practices, you know, so maybe not really understanding what it said in the last guidance 
not understanding what that meant for the species. In the commonages, there always seemed to be the one buck who was putting out a lot of sheep and the others were kind of saying, well, well, he's putting out all the sheep, but you know, so how do we organize that? When you have different private plots, everyone has a different way of expressing their macare management. Uh, if you go up to Ben Mullet, you'll see strips all over the peninsula and you'll see uh, every strip is different. So they're, it's all split into five hectare strips or thereabouts and some will be intensively management, managed, some will be only um, grazed in the winter. So, you know, it's I, I'm definitely going to write a book at the end of this. I mean, apart from the peatlands book, there's going to be this coastal book happening. But uh, importantly, it was that there's not one site, not, not one fits all. And you have to look at each site, which relates to all restoration activity um, from my experience. Um, importantly, the basic principles that we bring into each of our workshops is do no harm and secure the future. So that means from do no harm to the habitat, to the species, we want to stop further degradation. But we want to secure the future for the sites from a community and a farmer perspective, as well as from the system. The basic structure in terms of when we engage with the farmers and the communities is we, we develop this sort of structure. And I got this from uh, Michael Davern from the Burn program, where he said, look, this is what farmers and community people want to know. Why is each site special? So they have an idea why it's special for them, but why is it special from a Natura 2000s perspective? Why is it changed? So articulating that, and they can explain a lot. We understand the policy changes and how that has driven the changes in animal numbers and production driven approaches, but they understand their own motivation for doing that and maybe their motivation to change in the future. How do we get the balance back? How do we protect and restore together? And then the planning side and how we sustain that into the future. So that's the general approach that we do, uh, the five-step five step Mac Air program um, in terms of understanding. And it helps guide our conversation. So rather than going in and, you know, it, this is our framework of understanding each other and to know how we can get uh, to a shared future or a shared vision. Um, from the community engagement side of things, so sorry, this picture shows uh, two beautiful Dunlin, and this is something not many people will have seen. Um, the first time I encountered Dunlin was down at the Runa site, and so a very rare picture here, and thanks to Peter from Crowcrag for letting us share it. Um, so community engagement dovetails very much with the farmer engagement. So getting out on site, walking with the farmers. We usually have the meetings in the evening times. Using these temporary predator control fences as an education tool to say why it's important to fence off areas and make sure there's no disturbance, whether it's from machinery. So often these fenced areas protect from just quads or scramblers or tractors. But they're stopping also um, furry, furry fellas on the ground running in and out to grab a few eggs. So they're important education too. And you know, you can you can really uh, see the vegetation changing within as well with the exclusion of the graziers. Community engagement is about you know bringing people out to see this wonderful. Um, example of chestnut fencing at the Murphy site, which is, you know, linked to the photographs, I the aerial images I showed you. So these, this chestnut fencing was put up in May and you can see the sand has started to bank up within each of these boxes and the vegetation is importantly building the dunes back from the beach. So that's really important. Uh, our project officer, Mark, was very busy last week taking this out in advance of the big storm, which you know, could have taken this all out. So you put it in and you have to take it out. And uh, that's often uh, something people don't think about. 
Um, signage is really important. And on the sites that we have, we've tried different models. In fairness to the team, we've tried A4s, laminated, A3s, and then we started coming up with fancier signs this year. Um, so what do you put on the sign? And I I think there's a really interesting discussion. I could talk about signage for days, but you know, what we get in terms of feedback is less words, more pictures. So trying to find the right blend in terms of the do's and don'ts for these sites. Um, you know, the lands are commonage, but that doesn't mean they're common land. You know, they're they're private lands. Um, should you be uh, camping up there what you can do to respect the site and um, so we really need to develop this more this isn't finished by any means and maybe using QR codes directional signage all that sorts of things so I'm quite happy if anyone has any ideas or wants to share any thoughts on that one uh, community engagement is also about celebration and celebrating that these sites are amazing and so there's a couple of images here. So this wall here is from a handball alley in Ben Mullet. And we have our lapwing, our poster girl lapwing up there on site for all the children and the people coming to visit Ben Mullet to see. There's corn creek on the other side. Uh, so, but don't, don't think about corn creek for a moment. This is our girl here and uh, then the Mac care system. So, you know, people of Ben Mullet will get a better understanding of these sites are amazing. They're huge value. They're, they're spectacular. Our great yellow bumblebee, the last, you know, stronghold for it in Ireland. We need to get that species beyond the Mullet Peninsula. Um, working with local communities in Donegal. So we've linked in with a wonderful group called the Sea Collective, alongside Clean Coast and Leave No Trace up in Donegal. And just all of us coming together, bringing different views, different energy, and uh, the Sea Collective bring that marine interest uh, to the to the community groups. And Olivia Jones there from Clean Coast, and yeah, just wonderful people working in this area that really help to build energy and excitement as to why the sites are important. Um. I'm going to leave it there. Um, myself and Kieran agreed it was probably more benefit for you to ask questions and to find out more about the bits that you're interested in rather than me waffling on for the full hour. So I will say thank you very much. And I'm going to close with this wonderful picture of a red-necked phalarope, which is found up on the Mullah Peninsula on one of our sites. This guy comes all the way from the Galapagos Islands just to breed at Anna Marsh on the Mullet Peninsula. And, you know, they're so rare. The life project that Birdwatch Ireland led was focused around this. And I hope the work that we do can help secure the future for species like this and for the people, obviously. So I'll leave it there, Karen, and I will stop sharing my screen. Okay. That was great. Thanks, Catherine. That was, um... <clears throat> Really interesting and um, great to learn about what's going on. Um, we have a few questions coming in. So um, I'll kind of take some from the floor and I have a few myself, but um, actually a couple of questions will go straight in because I was wondering myself for a while about what chestnut fencing is, but then you did bring it up on screen. Um, but like similar to some of the people at home wondering so that is if you could just talk a little bit more about that kind of restoration element where you're you're putting in the fencing and i presume that helps as you said it helps the sand pool and that helps with the veg vegetation restoration like is, is there is there a seed bank in the sand like you would have with soil or is it more a case that the the grasses um have to be introduced by yourselves or will can they sort of blow in or yeah so how does that process work i know you're only um a year or so into the project but um yeah what have you observed and what, what's planned on that yeah so we've learned a lot this year in terms of the, the chestnut fencing so some of you might be familiar it's basically kind of lats tied together with the metal wire 
and it comes in 10 meter lengths. Um, you build it along a line um, where we built them. We, we put them in just above the high water mark, which meant that it was going to be protected from um, the tide coming in and, and, and going out. But importantly, by working with the guys in NUIG who had us identify that there was actually sand accumulating here. So that's a really important thing. There's no point in putting this fencing in to trap sand if you're not actually getting sand deposition. So that was the first thing. So then we come along with our chestnut fencing and the chestnut fencing is designed. So as soon as you put a stick or a post on a beach, it starts to, things start to gather around it. So you, you'll see this yourself with the drift line where you get seaweed gathered up on the shore, things start to accumulate there. So that's the basic concept that you put these lines of chestnut fencing in and the sand gathers over time. The configuration depends on your budget and what you want to achieve. So at the site, Murphy, there's, there's a huge area that has been lost uh, through erosion. So we needed to go big there in terms of developing these boxes. Um, if it wasn't in the line of fire of the winter tides and winter um, storms, we could have left that chestnut fencing in and it would have gathered sand over the winter. Um, the, each of the little pegs act as an area to accumulate sand but the boxes themselves create that shelter. And we, the picture I showed there over the summer, it has been incredible the amount of sand that has uh, been deposited in those areas. And then we were wondering, should we be planting with marum as soon as the sand goes in? You know, what do we need to do? Uh, so we did get native spe species um, colonizing and they would just be like the uh, drift line species and mobile dune species not so much the marum grass but we were getting couch grass in some areas and some of the uh, literature that you read you will see that often where marum is not available species like couch grass do the do the other job do fill mm. in that role so what i would say is this year we learned a lot in terms of using that uh, chestnut fencing. In other places, they leave the chestnut fencing in situ and the sand grows up and over and it provides a matrix or a support, an internal support. So we might get to do that in other places, but here it was very much trying to build a dune system from the beach back. We had left a few boxes in place to gather sand and learn over the course of the winter. Um, but it, it is, um, so just looking at the questions here, that it's chestnut fencing. We did actually have to get it from abroad and mm -hmm. we are looking to see if we can get a local supplier. So, um, or, or to use Willow to, yeah. to look at that as, as a potential. Um, we'll keep you posted on the other elements of the chestnut fencing because I'm not going to pretend I'm an expert. Um <laughs> until we, we we know more. But that's that's exactly what happened this year. And we need to reuse that in, in different places. So um watch this space. One of the outcomes will be um technical guidance document, and that doesn't have to be a document, it can be videos which show mm. what how you go about this. And you know, importantly for all the work we're doing, we have to do the AA screening. But also we want to develop templates so that when community groups or other people come in and say, well, how do you do screening? That rather than inventing the wheel every time, we can have templates, we can have videos and supports that people can just say, oh, I saw that on the Air video. And mm. um, or, or we can have workshops and training sessions as well. So that's kind of the crap there. And related to that, like, are, are you starting from scratch or is there, you Macare exists in Scotland as well. I mean, is there projects over there that you were able to learn from or visit or anything? Or are you, are you sort of starting from yeah. scratch on this one? Well, interestingly, we, we visited the US islands in this time last year. And that was 
really informative because there the, the whole farming is very much at the system level and I see a couple of questions in the um, boxes there about the getting the right grazing mm -hmm. the, the level of grazing right so what's really interesting in Scotland it's only cattle on the matter and it's uh, cattle for the good ground and sheep for the hills so they never put sheep on so that was a big learning for us and the way the commonages then are collectively managed in terms of the governance, there's none of this, oh, I'm going to put 300 sheep out there and that's going to be fine. I'm only supposed to put five. I'm going to put, but I'm, I've decided I'm going to put 300. Hmm. So everyone agrees. There's a clerk for the commonage. There's a register of the sheep, sorry, the cattle, uh, who puts what out when and how many, and then when they importantly take them off. Uh, so the whole governance there, local locally led governance, mm. and it, it matters if you put too many out. It matters because somebody else loses. And that may have happened in Ireland, but it's not presently happening on most of our sites. There's, I think, one commonage where uh, there's a collective agreement and then in other places, what you find is people have left the land and it suits that um, there's one guy just putting a load of sheep out, you know, so, so yeah, incredibly complex cattle. They wouldn't exist without the cattle. Somebody asked that uh, if they weren't there yeah. and if you just had sheep, they just become um, billiard tables which are just, you know, heavily shorn. And what happens then is they're less less resilient to the storms. There's less diversity. You know, you get that breaking up of the whole system processes, which have, um, you know, developed over time. Um, so I suppose really what we're trying to do is convey that message to the farmers. So mm. oftentimes the message they got was something completely different. You know, it was a, it was not the right message. And that's sort of driven through production or, you know, yeah, put a load of fertilizer out there or reseed it or whatnot. Whereas actually the quality of the grassland in these areas is superb. So you have a real diverse mix. Uh, talking with some of our farmers from the valley in Ackill, um, one of the guys had a wonderful expression that the cows, the the cows that were there, the milk that came off them would blow the head off you. It was so good. <laughs> you know, And so they were using all these herbs and just great production. And even for the Inishki Islands, the farmers there, they're very reluctant to reduce num numbers because the quality of the lambs that come off are just, they're in this wonderful, healthy atmosphere, lots of species. Mm -hmm. The species are there. But they don't get beyond a couple of millimeters. Yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> that's not good for waders. So wader chicks can't hide in that, and the big gull is going to come along and gobble them up. Or yeah. you know, there's there's no food, there's no invertebrate community, and there's, there's it's lacking the structure. So, so in, yeah. So so the, that's interesting. Like um, so you're making the argument there very clearly that that cattle is the way to go, and and um. Is there anywhere just the, in Ireland that where the cattle were kept, or has it all mo like most of the sites you're you're working on now have they all sort of sw have the, the the farmers already switched to sheep a long time ago, or was there any places where cattle actually remained as the main grazing style? And just out of interest, was there any pockets, or I wonder why that might have happened. Yeah, there's a a wonderful site in Connemara called uh, Albrack. Uh, I hate mentioning any of, you know, any specific site because, but this particular one has ongoing cattle management and the sward yeah. is superb. It's wonderful. It's an absolute vista of uh, fantastic color. Interestingly, they have extensive grazing throughout the year. Okay, so that would be a commonage where the guys there are working with cattle, three ag guys active there. Uh, they're looking after their cattle there is a road going through it so they have to keep an eye on them 
Yeah. Now that's no good if you're a part-time farmer and you want to put some sheep out and you want to check in on them on the weekend. Yeah. And, and you're, you want to put a load out and not think about it. If you go to the Muller Peninsula and especially into the plots where you'll find the great yellow bumblebee, those strips are superb. Like the napweed, you know, even now with some of the scabious there and great yellow bumblebee, but not just that species, you know, Bombus muscorum, you know, the large carder bee, other species that cuckoo bees, Bombus lapidarius. I mean, all these species that I should know the name of, but I do. And like, they're just in uh, in heaven. Now, mm. what's not there are the waders. So that, that relates to um, what's eating them. Predator. So mm. the, the predator side of things. But um, yeah, yeah, it's really interesting. It's really interesting getting the balance right. It's incredibly challenging because every farmer has a different view and yeah. the different different types of skin in the game and actually there was a question there about um the how do you decide the the right intensity of grazing i think i saw that um which um i suppose is i mean do you have recommended stocking rates that you would try and like communicate to the to the landowners to the farmers or are you at that stage yet or i suppose that's the question is asking how you decide the the grazing. So I guess that's would be an answer. Yeah. So it would be it would be quite low. So you might be looking at yeah. you know one one per two hectares, one livestock unit. Um. So it it's low and extensive, but what you have to understand is you can't just say that level and then you have to look. Is it just during the winter? Is it throughout the year? What's the type of animal? So the animal presently used the cattle, it they'd be more continental breeds. And you would have traditionally have had more short, short horn or smaller breeds. Um, we are looking to promote the, the mild, the Irish mild cattle breed, the uh, Drimmon cattle uh, that we met at farmer down there, who's doing great work on omi island and or in that that general area so he had he's breeding driven cattle so looking to use these lighter traditional breeds which don't need the same level of supplementary feeding mm -hmm. so if you have a continental breed they just don't do it with um just the the, the grazing that's there but these traditional breeds they were made for it and they eat everything and you know, they will, will pick through, they'll do the poaching in the wet areas. Sheep don't like going into the wet areas because they always like to think with their feet and you know, stay on the dry. The cattle will move through, circulate with the, the, you know, the whole dung element is really important for many of the hoverfly species. Uh, the use of, you know, dosage and all this in a lot of the Sheep has impacted as well on yeah. on the the dung in these areas, and that has impacted on the invertebrates. So, okay. like, there's this. Every farm needs a tailored approach, but you could have feasibly extensive grazing throughout the year, or just winter grazing, and you could yeah. still get the same result. That's what we're seeing, and um, so Karina from the Great Yellow Bumblebee is monitoring. A number of plots there you know for the last two years so we'd be able to tease out some you know real evidence as to what grazing level or the timing mm. of grazing so you know bespoke guidance doesn't really exist in this country yeah. and we have taken a lot from scotland and there would be some work from the uk interestingly in the uk on those dune systems they're not macker, but they're dune systems that would have been grazed. What they're finding now is that the sites are undergrazed. Yeah. So, you know, we're always trying to get this balance of we need we need farming for diversity and the right level for the you know the, yeah. that sweet spot, and then you go either side and you get something different. Now nature will just put up with it, but it's it's in it's for us to decide. 
And it's already in some ways mm -hmm. decided for us because we have the qualifying interests for the natura sites. We have the qualifying interests and the species for the SPAs. We have to work within those boundaries um, and then obviously link in with the wider landscape as well. So, um, yeah. So you, you, obviously, with within the project, you, you, it's focused on the on the the qualifying interests, the the elements of the habitat that we're obliged to to protect and restore. Um, yeah, I mean, what yeah. you know, Kieran. I mean, you can't throw the baby out with bathwater. You have <laughs> to look after everything, and just yeah. because a certain species is not listed or important and you know, uh, or a habitat and wetlands are really important, but not, you know, the wetland areas aren't priority habitats, but without them, you wouldn't have any species. So you have to, you have to think real, um, will be my sort of. And, um, well, that's good to hear that. Yeah. So the project, like you, you're, you're obviously you're, you're looking at the big picture and all the different value that site has for biodiversity. Um, yeah, we were just talking about grazing there. I suppose we could finish off by there's a couple of people who were asking, like, what if the cows weren't there? So I guess they're maybe interested is what would it revert to? I don't know if, if you know that, if you, you can answer that for those people. But um, you were already touching on how there's a balance. Like this is a a, a managed habitat that, that exists because of that grazing regime. But um, yeah, I guess what would happen if the if the livestock weren't there? Some people are wondering. Yeah, but they just become very rank and that just means you get a dense sward and the grasses get very coarse and you, you know, yeah. The, so the grazing means that it opens up the sward and that all, all this diversity can come in. So that's that's pretty much what would happen in in some dune systems. You might get scrub encroachment. So we talked about yeah. the Macare Plain. And then the fixed dune, so you could get scrub, scrub coming in, which is what's happening in the UK. So that's where they're starting to open up for to create these diversity areas. So, you know, it's not that the system would collapse, but it wouldn't be the what we define as these um, diverse habitats. Um, yeah. I see someone was asking about mob grazing. So we're going to try a bit of that in some areas where... It, it, there's a certain level of undergrazing and then the flowers that the yellow bumblebee love are the uh, knapweed especially at the end of the season and then the uh, kidney vetch sorry nearly lost the species <laughs> in my head uh, so they really really um good for those and that means you need the the, the food throughout the year so you get the food throughout the year on the Mullah Peninsula. If we can get that food source and shelter and the right management off the Mullah Peninsula, there's no reason why it couldn't move outside mm -hmm. of the Macker area. So that, that's the question there. Actually, um, yes. So you were saying, how, how would you, did you say the grazing is, is that linked to the style of grazing, the mob grazing or or uh, have you, so the, the food source is there um, on the mullet um in terms of the, the flowers and the plants so is there any particular yeah this, presume there's a goal as part of this project is is the great yellow bumblebee element and you're hoping that if you can recreate that food source elsewhere it it might sort of travel along the coast yeah and, and, yeah he, he, he or she has yeah. already been picked up in Ackle island possibly blown over by a strong wind yeah. But Michal O'Brien is monitoring that population out there for us. And um, yeah, so it all has an impact. I see someone asking about the um, managing the vehicle access across. So that's an ongoing uh, process in terms of how to manage and regulate the movement of vehicles mm. across. But there, there ha we have to come up with solutions. Um, and what so the, I'm sure a lot of people have probably driven on on Macair without knowing it, but um, so people are just driving on to, to with camper vans or just to go for a, a swim. So I mean, what is there that comes around to like, yeah, what can people do? I mean, is there there's probably not signage up in every Macair site, but generally, if a site looks sensitive, don't drive on it, or or what would be a kind of a 
a how-to yeah. guide as to what you can do as an individual to try and help these sites? I would park at the road and walk in. Yeah. So some of the sites in Donegal, there's no access at all. And people just park up and walk for 20 or 30 minutes and bring their board and have a great time surfing, walking the dog, to keep the dog on the lead, a short lead, um, especially during during the breeding wader season. But importantly, sheep, if they're on the site, get scared by mm. dogs and cattle also. So there's a kind of a general farming code, I suppose, you know, just respectful. And then from the habitat perspective, it's it's also but we haven't we haven't opened that conversation in Ireland about you know where we can have designated wild camping areas, you know, and where yeah. we, we need. So we have to start that discussion because we want people to enjoy and explore and just feel that Atlantic roar and yeah. be on a macker and just value these places personally through experience. That's that's the way you really generate a, a nurture respect and you know appreciation. But it's it's how do we do that um without wrecking the place? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, that's probably another you said I mean tourism is one of the pressures you're aware of, but that's probably a whole beyond maybe the remit of this project working a lot on that recreation but is there an element of that i mean i guess yeah. that's the signage uh, for a start is trying to get the message across yeah um, the signage and also i i did mention we're going to have community workshops um with you know the local people to understand yeah. their on their perception of the pressures and how they want to use the sites and then broaden that out to local authorities other interest groups and come up with some way of like bespoke guidance for these sites with Falch Ireland. So Falch Ireland are a really important uh, beneficiary on this project. And, mm -hmm. you know, they know that things like the Wild Atlantic Way is inviting people in, but, you know, that comes with responsibility. So you have to, you can't just invite a load of people and say, there's a party on, uh, but, actually you can't you can't go to certain areas which they haven't said you know so we need to yeah. we need to fix some legacy issues and we need to plan for future proofing these sites so covid made them very much more attractive um while some people knew about them and were enjoying them anyway but suddenly everyone was starting to explore their own coastal sites how is that going to change with climate change, warming? People want to come to a nice, cool, damp climate and do their thing out, out on the west coast of Ireland. So we can't just say, oh, well, that site's not really used. Yeah. Because we don't know how it's going to be in the future. So it's just starting the conversation, Kieran. And it's about being realistic without, you know, putting down the hammer and saying, that's that. Um, you shall you shall not pass we have to yeah. provide alternatives you can't it's like the whole debate with the turf it's like saying to people stop using turf where's what's my alternative i'm relying on this for my hot water so we have to get real for the people as opposed to just saying no and would the local i suppose the local councils could play a role there as well you said you're going to be running workshops and things so they even just start putting in facilities so that people don't have, you know, places for people to park, uh, they don't have to go onto the beach or or they signage as well. So it'd be good. It's, yeah, they I guess it's 30 days. Yeah. yeah, they absolutely do. And um, so we're working with them through the CARO groups, the Climate Action Regional Offices, and then through the tourism workshops and general planning. So there are bylaws relating to beaches would be amazing if we had some integrated coastal management plans or you know zoning and mm -hmm. so we we have we're we're still kind of in the back end of you know some nascent awareness of that nature is important and now we actually have to go and say oh okay we should look after that and put proper signage in and 
say we value it. So all organizations have a role to play. Yeah. Including your members. So, you know, everyone on this call can take the message and do send on any ideas that you have. Um, you know, there's lots of things in the chat there if you want to send me on a list of I ideas. I can, yeah. You're have. getting rec recommendations on, on fencing and everything, I think, from... Uh, or from no, we love signage fencing. From Ruth is giving us some tips on signage there, so that's welcome. Um, yeah, and like, is there any questions in the Q and A that you particularly want to get to? Because we're getting towards the end, and uh, they just keep keep coming in. But um, uh, just on the birds, the main predators will be fox, and it, it will be site specific or grey crow. So you have avian guys, and then you have the the furry um mink in some places too. Um, so the fences are electrified. Um, so that was one question there. Yeah. And yeah, I I think to be fair, there's a lot we're gonna learn. And yeah. so, you know, I would follow us on not not just to build followers, but if you want yeah. to hear what we're doing, um keep an eye on that and check out the website for different resources that we'll post up. We have a handbook there which kind of maps out the challenges. And I find that really useful myself, even just to keep going back to what are we doing in farming, tourism, education, awareness. And I think we can all sort of build from that, that in four, and a, four or five years time, we'll have much better guidance. Or we might feel we've just really mapped out the challenges properly. So identifying mm. the challenges and the uses and the pressures is the is the only way towards solutions. But at least we we will have started, and somebody or some group has given these often neglected areas some thought and consideration. So that's life on that here. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I suppose we should finish up. Um, unless there was there anything else you any. Anything else you wanted to add or any of those questions you wanted to get to? There's quite a few there, so um, probably no, have to leave most of them I unanswered. Think, I, I think I, I'll leave that and um, I'll leave it and yeah. look, drop a note into the Life on Mac Air website if, if you have a really burning question or send us, yeah. uh, send us a note and we'll, we'll take, take all feedback on board. And thanks. Thanks, Kieran. You're very welcome. Yeah, and hopefully it goes well. I mean, are you getting, I suppose one last question that I had was just the, because so much of this is is going to be around engaging the local communities and, and the farmers. And um, uh, are you finding like it's early days in the project, but how's that starting? Like, is there an interest there? Your initial engagement with landowners, is it going okay? Or is there, yeah. Yeah, there... it's it's mixed. Yeah. It's uh, there's, I've met some, some really interesting people and uh, different viewpoints and I've been challenged repeatedly and you know some people feel threatened yeah. uh, by change and that's understandable and it's really you know I, I, I feel bad for those people because they're suffering from a legacy of kind of misguided policies policy and, yeah. all that sort of stuff and you know they they've been sort of kind of conditioned into a way of thinking so a lot of um the work is really about you know presenting a new way of thinking and yeah. behavioral changes are the key stone and they can't be driven unless you understand you know why something is of more value so Restoration, I've always sort of described as being very social science and uh, psych psychological in terms of, you know, getting the brain. You know, you, you, you have a thought, a thought becomes an action, an action becomes a habit and a behavior, and then sort of it gets stuck with you. So, you know, we need to keep driving that. And obviously, you know, platforms like this are fantastic for you know, communicating different values and then all the members can go and, you know, spread the message and, and the word. But, you know, we're, we're not all there. We're not yeah. all there in terms of knowing uh, the innate value of these things. And it's about 
sort of being respectful on that journey. So yes, I've met lots of different viewpoints. I've, you know, experienced lots of different reactions and I am still convinced of, you know, the value of just listening, talking, taking time. It's not going to, it's not going to work otherwise. Yeah. And it, it's not going to happen overnight as well. So, I mean, it's, it's great to see this project and projects like it being, being funded now to sort of try and turn the tide on, on years of sort of policy that was, was really driving biodiversity down uh, in, in so many areas. So it's great to see, you know, taxpayers money funding your work and funding projects like this yeah. all around Ireland. And it's, it's hopeful anyway. So um, yeah, let's uh, keep, keep it going and, and more projects like this and, and, better more funding for them and longer term funding that's that's what we want yeah no as i say it's about integrating the learnings into the different institutes so you don't need a like you might need a coastal network or you know some support like the community wetlands forum which is what that's doing for wetland areas so having something like that where it can be a one-stop shop for communities that's really the need but the the departments should be resource to take on you know and implement the regulatory mechanisms that exist already through farm payments and you know those basic things should be yeah. enforced for for but so that's a key learning out of it mm. is how that can be integrated into those systems um so yeah yeah that's the long term they call it the afterlife, which yeah. I sort of um, think, what, right, okay, somebody had a sense of humor somewhere. Uh, <laughs> we're planning I... for the afterlife. So we're always planning for the afterlife, but I, I do like the living part as well. So Yeah. <laughs> I did see that term on your slideshow. I've heard it before, yeah. afterlife. Oh, oh no, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's uh, interesting. Yes, well, yeah. well, we'll let you go to enjoy the, the current life, but... Uh, yes, <laughs> yeah. thank you. All right, thank, um, you. thank you for your time, and uh, yeah, we'll let you go, and thank you everyone for watching and listening. Uh, yeah, we'll get this posted on our, our YouTube as soon as possible, um, so we can share it. But, okay, good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night, Slan. Good night, Catherine.